Okay, so my name is Manoj Prabhakaran. I'm a faculty member in the computer science department here. All right, so today we have three lectures, um, you know, one right now and then two uh, in the afternoon. Um, so the first lecture is on you know, just introducing MPC. Um, by the way, we call, you know, even though the, word, the phrase is secure multi-party computation, for whatever reason, we just abbreviate it as MPC. Uh, maybe when they started, they, they want to promise that it will be secure, but you know, I think it's secure enough. We could have called it secure. Okay, so here is a kind of story uh, of uh, MPC. Uh, so there is this company out there doing uh, auctions for you. Okay, and you know, do you want to trust a company with the, all your private information when you are doing auction? Can we do an auction without trusting uh, a central centralized auctioneer? Right. So you know, there are a bunch of parties, they all have some money with them. There is a seller who wants to sell some, uh, so they all have money and they have some utilities, right? So this is how much they're willing to bid for the, uh, for the order is being sold. So the way, you know, the way it would naturally work or would work in eBay is that the seller uh, or the, all the bidders will place their bids with the auctioneer. Auctioneer looks at who has a maximum bid and whatever, if may, there may be some conditions that the seller has set and then choose a winner according to all the, you know, all the criteria and then let the winner know, okay? But the problem here uh, is that if you don't trust the centralized authority, uh, there are a couple of problems. First of all, you know, you want to make sure that the declared bid, uh, that uh, the declared winner is actually correctly computed. Um, you don't want the, uh, want eBay to, I don't know, uh, reduce uh, prices or something. I don't know why they would do that, but you, know, you don't want you don't want to trust this party to do the right thing. You want to somehow enforce it if you could. And secondly, uh, even more uh, pressing problem or delicate problem maybe is that you are giving all these bidding information to this uh, central authority. They learn a lot about your preferences, your uh, you know maybe how much you make, whatever. Um, do you want to do that? So question is, could you do all this stuff? You want to get a guarantee that the auction is correct, correctly computed. You want to make sure that nobody learns about your bid, unless of course you win and you know you need to do the transaction. So except you know, announcing the winner and the winning bid, those who lost the auction, their bids need not be revealed to anyone. Right? All you need to know is that they lost the auction. Okay, so that's that's one kind of motivating question. Here's another, so let me put out a couple of questions and then we'll get to the answers. Um, so think of an uh, instance where a lot of hospitals are, you know, they have a lot of um, patient data. Uh, these are, you know, in various countries protected by law, privacy laws. They're not allowed to just share the patient records with other hospitals, okay? Um, on the other hand, um, they would like to pool all their data and do data mining on it. There's valuable medical information you can get by looking at you know, data from not just one hospital, but from you know, all the hospitals across the country, across the world. Okay, so this is what you'd like to do. You'd like to, you know, all these uh, parties to kind of, in some sense, come together, compute on their collective data. However, the data is distributed among these parties and it's private to each of them. So who will do this? Uh, who will run this data mining tool? Where will it be run? You need to, it seems, trust someone, some central authority to collect all the data, run the data mining correctly on it, and not announce, I mean, not uh, leak any private information, right, to each other or to our outsiders. So this is a general problem. Both of these are instances of a general problem called secure function evaluation, uh, where, you know, to abstract it out, there are a bunch of parties with their private inputs, x1 to xn, there is some publicly known function f, which they want to compute on their inputs. And let's say all of them need, want to find out this output of this function. Okay, so you want to compute a function f um, on private inputs without revealing information, without revealing any information about their private inputs. Of course, they do want to learn the output, so they don't want to reveal anything beyond what is revealed by the output itself. So the output of the function might already reveal some you know, sensitive information about parties' inputs. Uh, so you have to design your function, uh, you know, to make sure there is no such problem if you worry about that. But beyond that, you don't want to reveal anything, right? I mean, you, you are out there to compute f, so of course you will get the output of f. 
you don't want to reveal anything beyond that. So these, uh, so secure function evaluation is a general class of problems that you know uh, secure multi-party computation will deal with. There are there is a little more beyond secure function evaluation. So let me put out another example. So you want to play poker, some card game, you know, a bunch of players and uh, they're online. So there is no physical cards. They're not sitting around a table. So how do you do it? If you had a central trusted dealer out there, they could deal you the cards. You know, so what, is, what should a dealer do? So dealer need, no, what, what do you use a dealer for? They use, I mean, they, uh, guarantee you that the cards are shuffled you know, honestly, uniformly, randomly, and then they're dealt correctly. You know, same card is not dealt to two players, for instance. Um, and um, there should be complete secrecy. You know, this player shouldn't learn the hand dealt to this player. Right? I mean, that'll defeat the purpose of uh, the game. Uh, not just that, you know, it's, there's even, there are even more are demanding requirements. So say two players collude with each other. Okay? We don't want them to exchange their cards. You cannot, you know, if they collude, of course, you know, they might collude outside, through outside channels, and they might reveal each other's cards to you know, uh, one another. But um, at least they shouldn't be able to exchange their cards. Right? So you don't want that kind of cheating even if multiple players collude. So, all this you know, is trivial to do if you had a central dealer. They will make sure when you play a card that you are playing from a card, from the, from the set of cards that you were dealt. Okay? The problem is, can you do it without a central dealer? So do you see the problem so far? You know, you know, uh, uh, any questions on? You know? So it seems like a, I'm asking for something totally impossible, right? You do want somebody to look over all the data at once, make sure that you know, um, no card is dealt in multiple hands. And um, things like, you were dealt a hand, nobody knows what your hand is. Then you play a card, everyone should be guaranteed that you're playing one of the cards that you were dealt. But you know, they didn't know what that card was, right? So it seems like almost impossible if there is no trusted central party to look over the whole thing, how do you ensure this correctness? You know? in the face of all these privacy requirements. Okay. There is no privacy requirement, everything is fine, right? You know, everybody knows everybody else's cards. You can ensure correctness. Uh, but the problem is there is a privacy requirement in this kind of setting, okay? And there is no central party to take care of all the, uh, all the computation. So that is the very ambitious goal of uh, secure multi-party computation. You know, so without having a central trusted party, you'd like to do all these fancy things, you know, some distributed data mining, um, auctions and so forth, uh, games on, on uh, you know, over the internet, things like electronic voting. Um, you know, nobody wants their vote to be revealed, but you want to make sure the vote is correctly tabulated and you get the sum, and the sum of uh, votes each candidate received, right? So, you know, those kind of settings, uh, more abstractly secure function evaluation. In fact, this is a very ambitious goal of doing any task, okay, any task, for which you would have used a trusted party. Of course, you want to do it without using this trusted party. Okay? So that is the problem of secure multi-party computation. So I'll pause for a second and take questions because you know, this is all that we are going to do in the next uh, three days. So any questions on what MPC is? Oh, it's all, I think it's all very clear, hopefully, because it's a very simple idea. Um, but you know, if you had any confusion, Okay, so what we are doing is, um, you know, emulating trusted computation. And I want to point out this is, you know, when people hear about cryptography, um, your notion of cryptography is not this. I mean, you are maybe not you, but you know, the, the general uh, computer science crowd. You think of cryptography as something that's used to uh, enforce uh, secure communication. Okay, so it's encrypted, it's authenticated, and so they are, we are emulating a trusted communication channel. Trusted in the sense nobody can look inside, and, uh, and if I got a message from here, I know you are the other, you know, the person who sent it is at the uh, other end of the line, right? It's other end of the channel. So that is what in, traditionally cryptography has been used for. That is still the 
probably the one least serious application of cryptography in real life, you know, when you use HTTPS or whatever, this is all that it's doing. It's ensuring, it's setting up um, trusted channels. Sometimes the channels can be a little more abstract, may not be an actual wire on a network in the sense that I might write something on a hard disk, come back five days later, decrypt it, things like that. So, it, But it's still some sort of a channel over time or space. All it's trying to do is uh, securing that, you know, the message, the communication. Whereas MPC, um, I should just call it MPC, you know, secure MPC uh, is redundant, I guess. MPC expands to secure multi-party competition. Um, so MPC uh, is actually doing something instead of emulating a trusted channel, it's emulating a trusted computer or a trusted center of computation. Okay, so it's conceptually like a big leap from the point of just communicating information as it is to computing on information. And what do I mean by trusted? A couple of things, and I'll, I'll expand this you know, a couple of times again. Um, so one is that it will not leak uh, one party's information to others, unless, of course, the output of some computation has to reveal it. And secondly, it will not cheat in the computation. Okay? So this is what you're looking for in a trusted source of computation. It's a little more delicate than that. You know, once you get to trying to define it, um, you know, what is the correct computation is not easy to define, so we'll get to that in a bit. Okay. So one way to think about MPC is as this remarkable tool that will help mutually distrusting parties to collaborate. Secure communication, you know, you distrusted the outside world, but the two endpoints of the communication trusted each other in the sense that if one of them were corrupt and leaking information anyway, there is no point in, uh, you know, uh, keeping the information secret. Uh, I'm sending you information because I trust you in some sense. Okay? Uh, of course, I want to make sure that whatever message is coming to you, coming to me is from my trusted uh, peer. But, you know, the two parties, there are two parties who are trusting each other and then there's an outside world who is corrupt. But uh, with MPC, people don't trust each other, right? The poker players, they don't trust each other. The bidders in the auction, they don't trust each other. And you want to collaborate, you want to work together. Okay, so having a trusted, a globally trusted party would have enabled it, uh, in the absence of that, MPC can do it for you. Okay, so MPC will enable mutually distrusting parties to collaborate without anyone trusting anyone else, essentially. Okay, that's at least a, a theoretical goal. So before I get to some more kind of details, I know, some of you have heard about MPC, I've been working on it, um, but for others, if you're you know, kind of new to, or if you're just a computer scientist, uh, uh, you know, uh, or you're just doing your BTEC in computer science, you may not even have heard of uh, MPC, and you'd wonder, is this for real? I mean, everyone has heard of encryption because we use encryption. Uh, does this thing, you know, exist? So the point is, we are getting there. We're getting to a point where people are starting to use MPC in their, you know, in, in the real life. So there are, two, as a starting point, there are at least some, there are soft, there is software you can download today, run it, and it'll do some sort of MPC for you. Okay, so there are many implementations and platforms. Um, this is just a name of, uh, the names of a few of them, you know, the Fair Play was one of the older ones, but, you know, so the security of these things improve over time, um, in the sense that even though when the first of these implementations came out, Fair Play in, I don't know, 2005 or 6, we already knew enough of the theory, but the implementation was f for something much uh, less secure in some sense. But over time, you know, people have started implementing things which are kind of meeting the state of the art in theory in terms of uh, the security guarantees. Of course, there's a whole lot, uh, long way to go. Things are not um, you know, secure enough. Things are not um, fast enough as they could be. Okay, so there's uh, still a lot of implementation to go. But and it's not just that there are, there are, there are software people wrote. People actually tried using these things also. So that there are many practical systems which use some form of MPC, you know, one of these uh, softwares probably. Uh, in particular, there's a Danish company, uh, Partisia, uh, by uh, involving many theoretical cryptographers, uh, Ivan Damgard for one, um, who actually had, uh, you know, good success, at least for starters, um, in uh, real-life deployments. OK, 
Okay, so they have done it's all information from their website. I, I trust them. Um, they have deployed MPC in sugar beet auction. So it's an auction, right? Uh, electricity auction, spectrum auction. It's kind of thing. You know, we have had big scams about uh, you know big news about scams, um, and some applications in key management. Okay, where it would be good to have a trusted party. You know, coordinating a bunch of parties who don't trust each other. Um, so these are all you know multi million or uh, know, maybe hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of euros worth of business um, uh, using MPC you know running on top of MPC so it's like real serious business um, then there are other kind of potential businesses which have not yet been really deployed as well as I can tell um, so there is a a prototype for secure credit rating. You know, credit rating is a very kind of invasive, you know, in terms of privacy, a very invasive procedure. They need to know your, you know, what all you bought and everything, right? Um, or what are you doing with your money? Uh, so if you could do it kind of securely without revealing all your information to the rating agencies, that'll be very great. So there is a proposal, a prototype for credit rating. Uh, so research supported by Danish banks. Outside of Denmark also, people have done things. So there is some proposal uh, to do the Estonian Tax and Customs Board, uh, you know, a proposal to the, to the board for doing their, uh, you know, uh, various um, procedures using MPC, okay? So that it'll be all private. Another kind of uh, example application um, people have tried. So when I said tried, what they've done is in these cases, they actually implemented uh, run it and you know looked at how fast it is for the actual amount of data that will be needed in these real life scenarios and you know uh, they kind of look good. Okay. Maybe not out up there but kind of good. Uh, so this kind of proposal is um, you know different countries have their satellites, spy satellites and whatever out in the space and not everyone knows about everyone else's satellites. You, you know, that's, if you are doing a spy satellite, you don't want others to know about your satellite. But satellites are expensive and you don't want two satellites to come and collide with each other. Uh, so you want to try and avoid collisions. You want to see where the satellites are going. Um, so you need to uh, look, you know, somehow you do need to know where the other satellites are. Okay, so uh, MPC would be a good fit. People want to collaborate to make sure they are not colliding with each other but they don't want to reveal the exact location of their satellites, okay? So they just want to know this one function of their uh, private data. Okay, so yes, it's you know, getting there. It'll, it's something that would be real uh, sooner or later, okay? So uh, just, uh, you know, that's where kind of we are now in 2017. Um, just to flash one slide of maybe the very beginnings of MPC, uh, this was a technical report. Uh, I mean, this one was published later. The technical re report was in 1978 by uh, Shamir Rivest and Adelman. And they asked this question, you want to play mental poker? You know, one of our examples uh, that you showed. Can two potentially dishonest players play a fair game of poker without using any cards? For example, over the phone, uh, this paper provides the following answer, and I guess they wanted to be uh, cute, but also kind of, there is a paradox in MPC, which this brings out. So they give two answers. First one is no, rigorous mathematical proofs applied. Yes, correct and complete protocol uh, given. Of course, you know, the statements are a little overstatement now in hindsight maybe, but this is, this is you know, this is the spirit, is the, this is the spirit, right? That we can do something which is essentially impossible or in some sense, you know, you know, impossible, and uh, uh, still using cryptography, we can actually do it if you define your goals the right way. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what I'm going to do for the next hour or so, uh, first of all, you know, kind of define or try to define security. I won't do it in full flesh detail, but just enough to give you a sense of you know there is some concrete definition for security. Um, and the other thing is, you know, this uh, magical impossible thing, how can one do it, right? Um, so I'll try to give you a kind of warm-up protocol. Uh, it is not secure enough, you know, it's uh, secure against a very weak kind of attacks, uh, but still it's very crucial. It's already something that's, um, so I'll do this uh, 
very important uh, protocol which I'll call BASIC GMW. GMW stands for the or the, is a, um, uh, the initials of the authors Goldreich, Michali, and Wigderson. They had a paper in '87. Uh, and you know, there's an adaptation of that thing, or part of that thing. They have, they have bigger protocol which gets much higher security, but this is a very crucial component. So we'll talk about that. It's very simple. So you know, good enough for a, uh, simple enough for a first uh, first lecture on MPC. So I'll try to get you through that. That's kind of going to be the main goal. And in between, I might allude to various issues. Some of it will be covered in subsequent uh, to lectures in the school. Okay. So what does it mean to be secure? Um, to begin with, I'll put out a kind of an important distinction or terminology. Um, so two things. So we are talking about protocols, right? Parties talking to each other. Uh, so the protocol is basically the instructions to the honest players. If you, uh, you know, if you are, uh, if you were an honest player who wants to be secure, you are required to follow this. Okay? If you deviate from this, there are no more security guarantees for you. Uh, so the instructions tell you. Having seen so much stuff so far and your input, what is the next thing you are supposed to do? Okay, what is the next message you are supposed to send? So parties are exchanging messages. Uh, they have their local inputs, possibly local randomness. So they flip a bunch of uh, coins or random bits. And then at the end, they produce some output. Or in the middle, they produce an output if that's a kind of task. Uh, so that's all part of this next message function for each party. And that is a protocol. Okay, so protocol is just gives us instructions, a program as to what each party should do. The other crucial component uh, uh, or concept is the functionality. Okay, so this is what we are trying to achieve. Okay, this is not the protocol. It's not that we want to run the protocol, the specific and all the cryptography in it. Our goal is to just be able to run an auction. Okay, say so that is a functionality. So the uh, of, uh, you know task we are trying to achieve, how do you formally mathematically specify it? Again, it's specified as a program. Uh, but now it's a program of this virtual imaginary trusted party, right? this guy. Uh, so if there were a trusted party, this is what that trusted party would have done for you. Okay? So that is a functionality. That's a very neat way to define what you're trying to achieve, uh, not in terms of you know, how much money you'll make or any such guarantees, which are in some sense, or if you're designing an auction, there are various you know, other goals you are interested in. We don't, as cryptographers, want to get into that. We say, okay, figure all that out. Assume you had a trusted party. What, you know, figure out what this trusted party need to do. Figure all that out and now just tell me the program of the trusted party. I'll implement using a protocol, uh, you know, using cryptography. Okay? So that's, uh, that, those are the two notions. So functionality is as imaginary, the program of this imaginary trusted party. And protocol is actually what the real parties should do to get the effect of having this imaginary trusted party. Just a few um, kind of high level security issues. So I said, as I said, and I'll repeat this a couple of times through the lecture. So one issue that, you know, is that the protocol, a protocol which you, you, know, you have designed may leak some party's secret. That's clearly a problem, right? If you're, um, you know, there's something that the trusted party wouldn't have done. If I send a message, it won't just reveal it to everyone else. So this is clearly an issue. And um, this is an issue even if everybody said, uh, you know, we are going to follow the protocol. We are not deviating from the protocol. But if the protocol itself says, you know, send my input to another party, the protocol is leaking information, right? So this kind of uh, problem is really, you know, it's a problem even against what I call honest but curious adversaries. An honest but curious player or an adversary would follow the protocol exactly. But whatever the protocol leaks, it is listening in and it will, you know, Whatever comes to it, it will try to gather all the information from it, right? So a, a curious party will learn things it ideally shouldn't have. Another curious, I mean, another um, important point here from an application point of view, actually a lot of people are honest but curious, and if they could help it, they wouldn't even be curious in the following sense. So if you're a hospital collaborating with some other hospital, and if they send you their patient records, then suddenly you have a big liability. You're holding on to this, you know, all this information that was somebody else's privacy headache. Now it has become your headache also. You know, you will be subject to the same privacy loss, um, you know, if they are from another country, for instance, or same auditing requirements. So on the other hand, if you're just a service provider who never gets patient data, you're happy, you know, nobody is auditing you and so forth. And, uh, the whole 
you know, a picture will change if somebody is going to send their private data to you, right? So often getting, a, getting private data is not in your interest, okay? Um, at least as honest part is you, you usually don't want this, okay? So, um, you know, if you, so this is something you certainly want from your protocol. It shouldn't leak uh, party secrets to each other, secret inputs to each other, unless it is required by the functionality. Uh, the second thing, which is a little more subtle, uh, is it shouldn't give the adversary any illegitimate advantage, okay? Illegitimate influence on the outcome. So what do I mean by illegitimate influence on the outcome? Say in poker, when you're dealing the cards, you don't want the adversary to somehow bias this distribution. You don't want them to always get, I don't know, ace of spades or something, right? So you don't want um, the adversary to be able to influence uh, outcome in any other way other than what they could have done in the, uh, done with the trusted party itself. For instance, if in an auction, of course you're free to choose your bid, right? You can choose your bid based on how much money you have. So that'll be legitimate. But what will not be legitimate is if you could choose your bid in such a way that it just beats everyone else's bid. But that's not legitimate because you don't know everyone else's bid, right? You're not supposed to know everyone else's bid. So you shouldn't be able to just say it's one rupees more than you know, the maximum of among the other bits, okay? So that will be illegitimate influence. So as you can, probably can see, it's already a little subtle, right? How do you say, you know, it is free to choose, uh, you know, uh, or a corrupt player is free to choose his or her input, but um, it shouldn't be in a way that is not permitted in, you know, uh, if you're actually talking to a trusted third party, okay? So to, you know, cle most cleanly define this kind of subtle security issues. What we do is what I've been kind of informally doing throughout. We always keep comparing with this ideal world where we have a trusted party, okay? So it is a real ideal paradigm. And we are running the protocol, uh, but what if we had a trusted party, you know, would they have created the same problem? That's always what we are kind of going to compare with. So the two worlds, the ideal world is when you have a trusted third party, if it's a two-party setting or trusted, you know, uh, trusted part, common trusted party, uh, to whom these part, the other players are, are interacting, with whom the other players are interacting, so they just send their input. Uh, and as, uh, if it's auctioneer, uh, he or she does the computation, gives you the answer. That that is the ideal world. They don't learn anything more, so they are free to choose. So Bob is free to choose his bid, but he should do it without knowing what exactly Alice said. He might have some prior information about what Alice might send. He can base it on that. That is legitimate, you know. Whatever he can do here is legitimate. And we want to make sure when they talk to each other using the protocol, they don't get any more advantage than that. So here also it's legitimate for Bob to use his prior information about Alice and, you know, choose his bit, okay? So that's what we want to capture. It's a little tricky, right? And how do you capture all this prior information? So we'll get back to it um, in, a, in a, maybe in, even in uh, one or two slides. Um, but intuitively, this is going to be our security guarantee. We'll call our protocol a secure implementation of the functionality. If whatever could go wrong in the protocol could have anyway gone wrong here. So what could have gone wrong here? Maybe because Bob knew something about Alice's uh, preferences, so he, you know, made his bid exactly one rupees more than Alice's. So that is something in some sense, you know, went bad. But hey, that could have happened in the ideal world. It's not our problem. It's a problem with, you know, whoever is designing the auction or it's a problem in the world out there that Bob has some prior information about Alice. Uh, but it is not the protocol's problem, right? So we'll say, okay, whatever bad thing could happen in this world, if it already happened in this world, then it's not the protocol's problem, you should consider the protocol secure. Protocol is not secure if something good, new could go wrong here that couldn't have gone wrong there, okay? So this kind of is a relative security guarantee we are trying to give rather than an absolute guarantee that, you know, hey, Bob will not be able to win the auction or something. We cannot give such an, an absolute guarantee. What we'll give is a, whatever Bob could do there, he could have done here, okay? Similarly for Alice. Um, so whatever an adversarial party, even by deviating from the protocol, could have done here, a party here could have done the same. Okay, that party you know, could have done the same. So, if, and if that is the case, you cannot blame the protocol for anything that goes wrong or is undesirable. 
So, before I actually formally define that, so this is still at a kind of an intuitive level because you know what does it mean whatever can go wrong here, what does it mean to go wrong right. I uh, will get to that in a second, but um, let me you know mention a couple of prominent threat models or adversarial models uh, we use. So, in adversary we think of in, 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 uh, in this whole theory of MPC or most standard way to do it is we think of it as a one centralized adversary who is controlling all the corrupt players. So, the moment you deviate from your protocol you are joining this you know big adversarial body out there and no more security guarantees will be given to you against the adversary. So, all your private information is now known to the adversary, all your actions could be controlled by the adversary if it is a you know uh, uh, if the, the adversary so chooses. So, that is a kind of guarantee you know model of an adversary it is a centralized single adversary and uh, it can corrupt any set of players and then it kind of gets control uh, over all of them okay, and sees all their information. And that is if an adversary in the real world is going to corrupt say Bob, we want to say okay whatever it could have done in the real world by corrupting Bob, it could have done in the ideal world also by corrupting Bob right not by corrupting Alice. So, in the ideal world also we want to say it is only that party who is corrupt, it is only that party whose guarantees we are you know uh, giving up right. So, all the information uh, the corrupt party um, all the private information of the corrupt party even in the ideal world we will say is available to the adversary ok. So, the ideal world adversary will corrupt the same set of players. There is a I will just mention it quickly there is a more sophisticated notion that the adversary may not ahead of time decide oh I am corrupting these guys and then we can talk about okay, the set of players the adversary corrupted right. Things could be a little more subtle the adversary could uh, you know as the game is going on go bribe somebody and corrupt them right. Um, so, they could start corrupting players dynamically in the middle of the protocol uh, and you know we do consider that it is called an adaptive adversary. But in this tutorial we will just stick to the static adversaries where ahead of time the adversary decides ok there is a set of players I am going to corrupt and then in the ideal world we will say oh we will corrupt the same set of players. Um, one important distinction between uh, I mean two classes of adversarial behavior uh, is the following passive adversary and active adversary. A passive adversary does not change you know it does not deviate from the protocol's instruction it will run the protocol you know this uh, uh, next message function honestly ok. But so, you could imagine it as you know you are running your program correctly, but you have some malware in your computer looking over everything happening there right all the what a you know cryptographic randomness keys anything you have all the messages coming to you all the messages you are sending out everything is known to this malware ok. But it cannot touch your computation your computation your program is running correctly they just have read access to your head ok. So, that is a passive adversary as opposed to an active adversary who you know if you are corrupt they just change your program they can arbitrarily you know um, uh, change how you behave this could be just a bug that may not be anything malicious, but we will still call it an you know, call a party with a bug in the implementation for instance an act uh, a party that is corrupted by an active adversary ok. Um, so, that that is a an important distinction uh, passive adversary when you are protecting against passive adversary we are mostly protecting against this information being leaked the first kind of problem that I mentioned, but against an active adversary you do need to worry about you know adversary getting um, undue influence on the output ok that too ok. So, coming back to the question of how to formally define security I won't right to many you know, equations or anything, but um, it is in terms of these pr processes right the real and ideal world processes. So, let me tell you what uh, the abstraction is. So, this is my ideal world now there is another new entity. So, let us see what it so that is Alice and that is Bob I call them interface uh, you know I have to fit it in that icon there. So, the interface is basically just if you are doing an auction it is a dummy dummy program right it takes an input saying ok I want to bid for this much send its bid to the central party and then the central party gives you an answer you know saying that you you won the auction or you lost the auction just output that to your local environment local environment could be your local operating system some other higher level program you are running which is calling this uh, functionality right. 
So, this is just the door to the functionality, this is just your local um, you know, kind of uh, function call you will make which is supposed to talk to the functionality, the trusted party and get, uh, get the result of what the auction is. Okay? So, it takes an input from the environment, gives an output to its environment and this environment is a very nebulous thing, it has you know, some parts of the environment are Alice's computer, some part of the environment are Bob's computer they are doing various other things with each other, um, you know, other protocols are running, um, you know, uh, we have no idea what it could be, right. So, we are trying to keep that abstract, okay. And then I have this uh, strange guy there, I will get to, get to that in a second, but let us go and look at our uh, real world. So, now Alice and Bob actually have programs running, the next message function, right. So, that is a protocol. So, they have the protocol. I put this uh, uh, guy there, it is supposed to be the adversary, okay. So, first of all it might be able to eavesdrop on their communication unless you protect the communication using some uh, cryptography already, but more kind of devastatingly it can corrupt a player. I do not know if you can see the red thing there, you know, it can just say oh I am going to corrupt Bob, okay. And now Bob is completely under the control of this adversary, now, if it is an active adversary or if it is passive, the adversary can see everything coming into Bob the message is there, the input output here, everything it can see and the internal state of that protocol at Bob's side. To define security we will say okay, we will consider an adversary in the ideal world who can corrupt exactly the same set of parties, so in this case Bob. Uh, so, in this ideal world Bob is already kind of you know uh, at the adversary's mercy, right, the adversary can see everything uh, Bob gets. Um, that is all we are trying to give as guarantee, the guarantees are going to be mainly for Alice, right. Um, and this adversary as well as this adversary, they are arbitrarily interacting with the environment, we do not want to prescribe you know what information about the environment the adversary might have and what kind of influence the adversary might have on the environment, okay. The adversary might even be able to influence the inputs going into the parties, uh, might even know some of it, okay. Uh, so, th there is an arbitrary interaction between the adversary and the environment. So, this is the real world, that is the ideal world. Now, we want to say whatever could go wrong here could have gone wrong there. So, the way we say that is we will say, so this is the definition uh, as much as technical math I will write here. Um, uh, for every adversarial strategy in the real world, so for every adversary in the real world, there exists some adversarial strategy in the ideal world such that we want to say whatever could have happened here could have happened there, right. So, such that for in any environment, okay, whatever this environment sees which um, you could think of it as the output of the environment, okay, whatever this environment sees is exactly what it would have seen there also, okay. Um, how do I say it is exactly the same? It is not like in the environment will see a particular message or you know particular set of messages it is a, it's a random process. So, there is some distribution over what the environment could see, with some probability it will see this, with some probability it will see that, it should be exactly the same distribution here, now there, okay. So, if in this environment Bob manages to withdraw cash from Alice's account in this environment with some probability and you know, by guessing a password maybe whatever, in this environment Bob should be able to withdraw cash from Alice's account with the same probability all that account and cash and everything is happening in the environment, okay. Um, guessing passwords or even choosing passwords and setting them, whatever it is you know is happening in the environment. There is one you know I said these two distributions should be identically distributed, they do not have to be identically distributed, they should be very close to each other, okay. Then there is a way to, to formalize that, will not get into that now, okay. Any questions on this definition? Because this is you know si simple as it looks, the more you look into it, kind of more you appreciate it, more you learn about it. Uh, so, it is kind of a deep uh, concept, but you know by now we take it for granted in, uh, in, uh, in cryptography, but it was not at all evident in the 80s when people tried to defend secure multi party computation, when Shamir Rivest and Edelman had that mental poker, they had no idea of how to define, you know, there, there are no such concept of uh, defining security by comparing real and real. So, it is a very non-trivial concept, but at some level it is also very simple, it is very intuitive, whatever could go wrong here by an adversary, you know, that an adversary could have affected in this environment, it could have affected in this environment. 
And maybe I should repeat this again. So if it could do that here, then it is not my protocol's problem. Right? So that is the main security. That's where the, you know, why it's intuitively a definition of security. That you know, if something goes wrong here, if it could have already gone wrong here, it's a problem with your functionality. Or it's a problem with your environment. Don't blame it on my protocol. No, it's OK. Good question. The environment is the same. There is no ideal environment. What is ideal is a protocol. Here it's a protocol. Here it is this interaction with the functionality. That's what has become ideal. The environment stays the same. If it was a bad environment here, it's a bad environment there. OK, so does that make sense? So that's why I'm, that's exactly the point that if something would have gone wrong here because of the environment, then it'll go wrong here also because of the environment. I'm using the same environment. Okay. So for every adversary, there exists a, an ideal world adversary such that in any environment, it's the same environment I'm considering, the two actions will have the same effect. Okay. Yeah. It's an arbitrary computation. It's an interactive computation, um, and in standard models, we'll call it a probabilistic polynomial time computation. Okay, and it's uh, it interacts with these parties. So it interacts with the parties as well as the adversary. Yes, yes. So we have we allow it to interact with the adversary also, because we don't want to make any assumption on yeah, what kind of uh, adversarial influence could be on this environment. Okay. And one important point is it interacts with the adversary even as the protocol is going on. Okay. So the adversary could live report things to the environment or take instructions from the environment. Okay? Sir, can you give more clear explanation of the environment? So environment models, um, all the other things that parties could be doing. Parties as in, if you think of parties as Alice and Bob. This icon here is not the entire party. It is not your computer. It just is one program for the protocol. Okay? So you say auction. It's only this program for running the auction. But this protocol gets, this program gets its input like, what is the bid you want to place? And you know, what happened at the end of this, the program should tell you, right? So this input and output to the protocol is coming from an outside environment, which includes your computer, which includes you, because you might look at this object and decide, I want to bid for 100 rupees on it, right? So you have all that modeled inside this environment, OK? So it, in some sense, it includes human beings also in this environment, right? All the interaction and the interaction that could be arbitrarily going on between, in some sense, the two endpoints of this environment, that right? your computer and the other guy's computer. Right? All that is in this environment, OK? It's, but at the end of the day, it's an abstract computation. It takes inputs. It gives outputs. Of course, there are, you know, if there are human beings involved, it might be hard to model it as a simple computation. But for our purpose, it's some efficient computational procedure. And to think of it as a Turing machine for all practical purposes. That's what we want. OK, makes sense. Any other questions on the definition? Can, can we call it Oracle? It's, um, it's an entity as you know, first class as other things in this model. So I wouldn't call it an Oracle as an it is. In some sense, the experiment itself. Okay, This is the main component in the experiment in some sense. And then you plug in either an idealized protocol with the trusted party or the real protocol into this experiment. And you observe the outcome of the experiment. And you want to say the two outcomes are same or similar. Okay. Any other questions? Manoj, uh, distributed identically in a probabilistic sense? Or? Yes, yes. So the, it's a distribution. So that's why I said distributed identically. And it doesn't have to be identical. It could be what we call statistically close. Okay, there could be a small error. How do you formalize small? I won't get into that. There, you know, we can do that. So yeah, it doesn't have to be identical. So this definition came about only in 2001. Okay, even though MPC, you know, Rivers, Shamir Rivers Edelman, and you know, earlier works, constructions like Yao's garbage circuit and so forth, came early in this, you know, late 70s and early 80s. We didn't have. You know this kind of a strong, full-fledged definition until uh, you know uh, 16 years back. Um, 
So it's called universally composable. It handles some issues like what happens if you run multiple protocols? This does model that, right? The other protocols could be going on in the environment. Uh, so that's the composition part, which Mutu will mention or talk about in his uh, talk tomorrow. Tomorrow. So, no, this adversary need not be passive. I don't know if you can see, I put a big red blob around Bob also, which means Bob is completely under the influence of this guy. If I model a passive adversary, then yes, Bob's protocol is running without being changed. If I consider an active adversary, Bob's pr protocol has been completely replaced by this guy. Okay, so yeah, both models are equally valid. In fact, that's exactly what I want to talk about the, in the next. Um, within that framework, you can consider different security models or different levels of security. So the classical notions of security from the 80s, so it's not like in the 80s when people had protocols, they didn't have definitions. They had definitions, but if you now revisit them in the, uh, from the point of view of the previous slide, you could think of those definitions as what we call standalone security, where the environment is not interacting with the players, the corrupt players in particular. The honest players don't have any reason to interact with the environment once the protocol starts uh, before the protocol ends, right? During the protocol, they are just running the protocol. They are not giving inputs and outputs to the environment, uh, but an adversary might be, right? Uh, standalone security means the adversary is not doing it. So it's like Alice and Bob and all of these parties got into a room and they are doing this computation without being able to talk to the rest of the world, right? Um, or another execution in, you know, the, in these computers. So that's, a, that's unrealistic, but that's still a very, very strong security requirement. Uh, you know. So that is, that is the classical security definition. Um, so it's like the environment is not, they, it provides inputs, then it stops all communication until outputs are ready and then it reads outputs and also anything that the adversary has to say at that point. Another class model which actually makes a lot of sense in practice, at least if you're considering a lot of parties, a large number of parties, something like an election or maybe a large scale auction, is what's called the honest majority model. Okay, so in the honest majority model, there are a large number of parties and it's only a small minority, you know, some fraction, who has become corrupt. The majority, maybe not just half, maybe a big majority, like you know, two thirds or more, we could assume maybe are honest. Okay? And if we could do that, we can get much stronger security guarantees, much more efficiency, you know, but of course security guarantees conditioned on the assumption, the, you know, conditioned on the fact that your assumption is correct. Uh, so that's called the honest majority model. And we'll have, you know, you'll see a lot of things in this model during the rest of the school. Uh, so the adversary can cut up only a small minority of parties. One thing I want to point out, it's not a useful kind of model if you're talking about a two-party setting. There are only two parties, and a strict minority means zero parties, right? Because if it's even um, one party, then it's not a strict minority. So in the two-party setting, when one party could be corrupt, honest majority, security, the model doesn't apply. And of course, if both parties are going to be honest, if you could be guaranteed that both parties will be honest, there is no need for all this uh, MPC. So it's not something that applies for two parties. It may not be a safe thing when there are only a few parties, but when there's a large number of parties, it may be a model you could work with. The other distinction, this one I already mentioned, passive versus active. So passive adversary also honest but curious. Um, yeah, where the corrupt part is just follow the protocol. Uh, earlier, uh, you know, even now, sometimes we have security definitions which are specific to a particular functionality. Okay, may not be something like auction, but you know, some simple functionalities which you know. So Mutu will talk about zero knowledge proofs today. Um, Arpita will talk about oblivious transfer. And for many of these kind of specific tasks, um, sometimes it's useful to have non-simulation based definitions. They're much harder to work with, they're more subtle. Uh, they do leave out subtle attacks that are possible. So there's no arbitrary environment. It's not like anything that could go wrong in the real world will go wrong in the ideal world. It's something like these specific things, you know, we guarantee that they won't go wrong in the real world. 
Okay, so that, that kind of definitions, they are sometimes useful, I mean often useful, but uh, it is not good as a uh, final security guarantee. It is useful for uh, intermediate uh, tools that you use. But, you know, sometimes people do use that. Um, another kind of uh, security model is that suppose already you were given, you know, some trusted party. Okay, if you have a trusted party, what is the need for a protocol? You just ask them to do your functionality. But what if this trusted party did some very simple thing and nothing else? For instance, all they did was toss, you know, independent coins and tell you. This is like some, you know, uh, astronomical uh, uh, phenomenon which is spitting out bits which you could model as random bits. You know, maybe from some particular distribution or after some processing it will be uniform distribution. But, you know, you could, you, so you can trust it to be doing its astronomical thing and not some adversary's bidding. Um, but you cannot ask it to do, you know, uh, you know deal cards to you, right, secretly. So you cannot um, get the trusted party of your choice. But sometimes you can get trusted parties of some, you know, which do something. And now can you use that trusted party which does something and build a secure protocol on that, on top of that, and often you can. And they give you a lot of uh, leverage. So there's a lot of, um, that's a security model, you know, uh, where you are given a trusted party doing some simple functionality. So, and when that's the case, we call that a setup. Okay, so we'll be relying on a setup. Finally, it's kind of uh, my biased view of uh, security definitions. Uh, something called angel UC, which is, so UC by the way is a shorthand for universally composable security from the previous slide. This is a variant which is technical, I won't define it or tell you what it is. Just want to point out that, you know, the full-fledged UC security, uh, I'll, you'll see in a second, is impossible to achieve for most interesting functionalities. There's a twist on the definition, some sort of a technical modification, which actually makes it possible to get security. Uh, even with all these composition guarantees and so forth. Okay. So, just wanted to mention that. Okay, so that's the security models. Um, can you achieve security? Is MPC possible? I'm actually running quite uh, late, so let me uh, just maybe try to speed up. Can we securely realize every functionality? Okay, that's kind of basic question we would start with, and the answer is unfortunately no and yes. So. Here, it depends on what kind of security you're asking for. So this access is whether you allow the adversary to only corrupt a small number of players, so you're an honest majority, or can the adversary corrupt an arbitrary subset of uh, parties. And these two settings, this is a computationally unbounded adversary, okay? So in cryptography, we often rely on computational hardness. So we model adversary as being probabilistic, a polynomial, probabilistic polynomial time, okay, PPT. So the polynomial time is a putting a bound on how much computational power the adversary has. A lot of interesting cryptography relies on that. You can do some cryptography quite a bit actually without relying on any computational assumption. So, so you could model a world where the adversary might be computationally unbound. So in particular, if you have honest majority, it doesn't matter how much power the, computer, the adversary has, you can do every function. We, I won't tell you how today, but we'll see that on the last day. Uh, Vasilis will talk about it. Um, however, when the adversary can corrupt arbitrary number of parties, uh, you know, you do need to rely on computational um, hardness. But even there, the answer depends on what kind of security you are looking for. So here the answer is a clear no, you know. It doesn't matter even for the weakest security definition like passive security, it's no. Uh, but for this world, which is kind of a realistic world, you know, you don't want to uh, put a, I mean, arbitrary number of parties could be corrupt, or you, want to, you worry about two party settings. So this is a realistic setting, and it's okay to live here because this is what real world is. Uh, if you ask for UC security, unfortunately the answer comes out no, irrespective of, you know, uh, being in a computationally bounded world. However, if you slightly go down that level of security, the answer becomes yes you can do every functionality securely. So the genie, you know, can have any program. You'll get security in any of these security definitions, okay? 
Okay, so um, in the remaining half an hour, I will try to give you a glimpse of how to do it, uh, how to get kind of magical security. Uh, uh, I will, yeah, uh, let me just, first I will give you a simple example which does not probably give you the actual uh, heart of the problem, a glimpse of the heart of the problem. Um, it is a simple example, still it is uh, it's good to know that you know some things can be done without any cryptography. Okay, so, the simple example is an auction, I okay, will um, think of it as a two party, two parties bidding, but it could be any number of parties. I called it an auction, it is a fancy word, it is basically just finding a max. Okay. And here are my, here is my variant of this pro, uh, auction. So, bid is an integer okay, and it is in a small range, say so 0 to 100 here. And Alice can bid only even numbers and Bob can bid only odd numbers. Okay. Alternately, you could think of it as when there are ties, you know, Alice wins. Okay. So, Alice has uh, one set of numbers, Bob has a disjoint set of numbers. And person with the higher bid wins. We want to find out not just who wins, but also what was their winning bid. Uh, but we do not want to reveal anything else. Okay. So, I cannot send you my bid so that you can tell me if I won or not because um, you know that will reveal to you my bid even if I was not winning. right? Of course, it has other problems also. Uh, so, here is a very simple secure protocol. The protocol goes as follows, you count down from 100 okay? uh, and at each round, so round numbers go 100, 99, 98. At each round, even round, an Alice has to declare if the round number matches her input. If it is, she will raise her hand and that is the end of the protocol. And if not, she will pass, then Bob takes his turn and you know, if he also passes, it comes back to Alice and so forth and back and forth until somebody raises their hand and the protocol stops. Okay. This is actually, so what do we learn in this? Um, what does somebody say for now, a passive adversary, what does it learn? It learns a winning bid, right? clearly that is when it stopped. It also learns that the other party's bid is lower than this, they did not stop the auction, but hey, this what it means for it to be a winning bid. So, you did not reveal anything more. Okay. So, it is clearly passively secure and in fact, it is also standalone secure. I will not talk about that. So, it is actually a real life protocol. It is called the Dutch flower auction. Instead of round numbers, you have some clocks counting down. There is a you know people, these are the flowers and these are the bidders um, and this you know is a or there is a slightly stylized version of the uh, Dutch flower auction. Okay, so, that is a very simple example, you know, it convinces you, okay, there are some cute things you can do without needing any cryptography, no encryption, no nothing, okay. just do it in the right order. But unfortunately, that can go only so far, most things need more cryptography. So, let me tell you another functionality, okay. it is oblivious transfer, uh, it is about transferring one out of two things the way this is modeled here, um, without revealing which one was trans, you know, which are, without the sender knowing which one. So, let me give you a little quick story. So, the sender here has, uh, you know, can predict stocks and there is a, a receiver here who would like to know this stock values, right. So, I am giving you the ideal world, whether that is uh, what that is what is what, oblivious transfer. Okay. So, for simplicity assume this guy has only two stocks, you know, whose values he is predicting and the prediction is just a bit up or down, okay. Just every day he predicts the stock A went up, stock B, oh, stock A will go up, stock B will go down, things like that. So, the receiver is interested, ah, I want to find out uh, this thing, but you know, she has to pay him to find this prediction. So, she just wants to find one, you know, she is only following an A, right. So, she says, okay, I just need one prediction. Uh, he says, okay, sure, tell me your, you know, which company, which stock you are interested in, I will give you the bit prediction. But she says, no, no, I cannot tell you it is my private information as to which company I am following. Um, so, I cannot tell you which one I am interested in, but I want just one. Okay, so, there again you start, this is the, one of those impossible things uh, which you cannot do without cryptography if against a computationally unbounded party funds. Okay, but if you had a functionality, so let, we are in the trusted third party setting, uh, we will uh, abbreviate oblivious transfer as OT, that is an abbreviation you will see a lot in this uh, school. Okay, so, then this guy will just send his two predictions to the central authority or the trusted party and 
she will send her choice whether she wants A or B to the central authority and this guy will respond with just the corresponding answer. Right? So there are two pieces of information. She could go up and pick one of them up without this guy knowing which one she picked up and without her knowing the other value. So she doesn't know what B is going to be. Okay? She will only know what A is. Okay, so that's uh, this guy has two inputs, x0, x1. Uh, this, uh, she has one choice bit b, and she learns x sub b. So b equal to 0, she learns x0. b equal to 1, she learns x1. Let me show you a quick protocol for that. Okay, kind of a rough and, uh, uh, you know, not, it's only passively secure. Okay, so it's only going to be secure against a passive adversary. An active adversary can easily... Um, Circumvented, and I don't want to bring in too many. There are many, many protocols for oblivious transfer. I want to give something which looks familiar. So this is in terms of an encryption, but there are some public key encryption, which I hope more of you are familiar with than OT, um, than with OT. And um, it's not a. So I'll say what I mean by special in a. Yeah, in a, it's not a standard public key encryption. There's some special property. Okay, so here's how the protocol goes. So this party, now this is a protocol, gets an input x0, x1. This party gets the input b. And she picks two, she uh, is going to pick two public keys for this encryption scheme. So what is a public key encryption scheme? There is some algorithm called key generation algorithm. And you run it, you get a pair of a secret key and a public key. A public key is something you'll publish which anybody can use to encrypt messages. But you need the secret key to decrypt. Okay. Okay, so that's, you know, she'll uh, pick up such a pair, but she will also sample a public key. Without running the key generation algorithm, she'll just go and pick a random public key. And often public keys are just random bit strings, so, you know, just pick a random bit string, call it your public key. Uh, so that is a, that's what's special about it, though. You know, it's not always the case that you can, you know, in, say, RSA encryption, you cannot get a public key, kind of, without actually going, you know, taking two primes, multiplying them, and things like that. So, but, but suppose you could, you know, uh, do this. Sample a public key without having no idea of the, without having any idea of the secret key. That'll be, you know, that's a special property. So she picked two keys, pk0 and pk1. I call them pkb and pk1 minus b. If b equal to zero, this is pk0 and this is pk1. If b equal to one, this is pk1 and this is pk0. Okay, so pk1 minus b, the one she doesn't want, is sampled so that she doesn't know the secret key. So now the protocol should be not too, uh, you know, uh, should be kind of obvious. So she sends these two public keys to uh, the sender, and he will encrypt the two messages, uh, uh, C, uh, the x0 and x1, using the respective public keys. Okay, so though he gets to ciphertext C0, C1, which he sends to uh, Alice, or the, the receiver, she can decrypt only C sub B, for which she has a secret key. And C1 minus B remains, um, you know, uh, let me see that, yeah. C1 minus B is completely, you know, looks like a, a ciphertext which she cannot decrypt, so she doesn't know what the message inside it is. Uh, on the other hand, from the point of view of the sender, what did he see? He saw two public keys, both are valid public keys, you know, honest public keys. Of course, one was generated in a way where the, you know, sender, know, the receiver knows the secret key. The other was generated uh, differently, right? But he doesn't know how they were generated. He just sees two things which are coming from the same distribution. So he doesn't know anything about B. Okay. So any quick questions? So that's kind of the only, you know, crypto protocol you'll see. I'll, I'll have more, another protocol coming up, but it doesn't have this kind of encryption flavor. Okay. Fine. Okay. So, you know, we can do, uh, we can do oblivious transfer. This totally breaks down if uh, she was actively corrupt. You know, why would she do that? She will pick both of them using the key generation algorithm. But for passive security, this is good enough. Um, Okay, so what I'm going to show you now is a protocol for two-party secure function evaluation for any arbitrary function. Okay, 
so any function, in fact, there, are, there could be two functions f and g. So, Alice and Bob feed x and y, Alice gets g of x y, Bob gets f of x y. Okay? That is called secure function evaluation. We already talked about secure function evaluation. In fact, you could have something more fancier, something fancier um, where the functions are not deterministic functions, they could be randomized functions. So, that corresponds to central power authority picking more an additional input, a randomness. Right? So, not just these parties inputs x and y, but an additional input r and these two outputs g and f are computed on x y r and x, I mean on, on x y r, okay? f of x y r and g of x y r. And of course, they should, the, you know, we do not want the parties to learn this r. Okay? So, there is a little bit of question of okay, the system pick this randomness when you implement it as a protocol, neither party should know what that randomness is. Uh, we will get to that in a second, but going back to OT, OT fits a deterministic secure function evaluation model where uh, you know the G, the, the sender gets nothing, the output is nothing and the receiver gets X of B, the inputs, this is the X, this is the Y. Okay? So, that is a special case of secure function evaluation. Uh, one kind of specialized subset of secure function evaluation problems is when only one party gets the output um, and OT is such a protocol, such a functionality. Okay. So, uh, simple thing first before we do the whole thing, uh, the general model, the general problem I said I gave had both parties getting the output, uh, that is not so crucial even if I could do, even if I figured out how to do functionalities in which only one party gets the output. Okay, so, there is only f, g is absent. You can easily use that to construct. So, suppose you had a trusted party doing uh, for you, of, you know, an arbitrary function in which only one party gets output. Then I can use that trusted party to implement a protocol in which both parties get the output. Okay? Um, actually, since I am short on time, I will just skip that. You can do it uh, using some very simple uh, you know, one time pad kind of approach. Uh, but that is not very crucial to my um, point here. The point is um, actually a single output is not very crucial either. The point is any SFE you can reduce to this oblivious transfer. Suppose I had a party doing this simple oblivious transfer for me. Okay? So, it takes two bits from me, one choice bit from the other guy and gives them that uh, chosen input. Just that trusted party, I will use that trusted party many, many times, could be used to do any function securely. Okay? And I am going to only stick to passive security in this tutorial, but uh, in this lecture, but it will uh, work for other active adversary also. Okay, first of all, why is oblivious transfer, why has it got this kind of a universal power? The simple thing, how can you use it to do anything? Okay? Um, so, here is a proof of concept that will you know, kind of demystify it, I guess. Uh, it is not very efficient, but uh, oh, okay. actually I am going to tell you the plan for, uh, so this is what I am going to tell you next and this is not something I am going to tell you. There is a protocol called Yao's garbage circuit which Arpita will talk about in the afternoon, uh, which will do it. This is what I am going to really tell you, this GMW protocol um, which uh, uses oblivious transfer, no other computational assumption. So, that is called the information theoretic setting, the computationally unbounded setting um, to do any SFE function. And uh, in fact, yeah, all this is for passive security, but it works even for active, uh, against active adversaries. Okay, so, let me start with this proof of concept, it is just one quick slide. So, it is a single output uh, setting. So, you know, only one party gets output, Bob gets output. Alice has x, Bob has y. Um, Bob wants f of x y. So, Alice does not know y, okay? but you know there are only so many possible values of y. Well, there can be many possible values of y, but it is finite set for us. So, she will enumerate f of x y, she knows her x, she enumerates f of x y for all possible values of y. Okay? So, she makes a big list and let us imagine the you know, bit is a single bit output or something here. So, she will make this big list of n capital N which is 2 to the number of bits of y, right? If y is a you know, 3 bit string then there are 8 possible values of y. 
So she'll prepare this uh, list of eight possible values of f of x, y, one for each possible value of y. And then they will engage in an oblivious transfer. Slightly different from the oblivious transfer I showed you earlier. In, instead of being one out of two, this is a one out of n oblivious transfer. So Alice has this list. Bob wants to come and pick up the yth entry. Right? He knows which entry he wants to pick up because he knows y. He has no idea what the you know, x was, but he knows that you know, the yth entry in that list was correctly computed for the correct x. So he wants to go sneakily pick up f of x, y, the yth entry in this list without learning any other entries. Because if he learns other entries, then he will start learning something about x. And of course, you don't want Alice to know about which entry he picked up. That's exactly what OT gives you. Okay? Um, so without learning um, anything about the other entries, Bob will go pick up f of x, y. Okay? So that's why you know, OT would be useful if you can do OT. Um, of course, the catch here is that is one out of n OT n, and is n is exponentially large in the number of bits of y. Okay, so for most interesting functions, this will be, or for many interesting functions, this will be prohibitively exp expensive. Uh, I should tell you how to do one out of n OT because I told you only one out of two OT, but that's easy because so this is one out of n OT. You know, first party has n inputs, second party has one input, first party gets nothing. Uh, Okay, I called it f, so it's only what the second party gets. The second party gets x i, x sub i. Um, if, if you had one out of two OT already, to get to one out of n OT is trivial. You run n instances of one out of two OT, and in each instance, the two inputs that Alice should feed are x i and some fixed thing, say zero. Okay? So she feeds x i as a first input, zero as a second input, in the ith instance of OT. And in every instance, Bob you know, goes in with this bi, oh, actually I'm calling it bj. Uh, yeah, so in jth instance, Bob goes with bj. B, bj is going to be, oh, I have it here, okay. So this is the, these are two inputs that Alice gives. Zero as a first input, xj as a second input. Bob goes in with a bit bj. So Bob doesn't want to know xi, xj for i not equal to j, right? So for i not equal to j, he will, set bj to be 0, he'll, so that he'll pick up this. For i equal to j, he'll set bj to be 1, so that he'll pick up xj. Okay? So that's trivial if um, it's passive secure. Uh, we are looking for passive security. Even for active security, it's not much harder, actually. You can, I mean, it's a little more subtle, of course, but you can do it. Um, so that's just some you know, aside. Okay, 1 out of n OT, we can do. That's not the problem. The problem is when this n is really large. Okay, so we need to somehow break down a function instead of using this kind of, you know, truth table representation, one value for each, one, you know, entry for each value of y, so there will be exponentially many entries. That's kind of too bad. We need a more compact representation of functions, and the compact representation of functions we'll use for most part is a digital circuit, okay? Could be a Boolean circuit, could be, uh, arithmetic circuit. So Boolean circuit means, you know, so familiar wires are bits and you have gates like AND, OR, and, you know, XOR, and so forth. Um, and each wire comes out of a unique gate, but it could fan out, right? You cannot just put two wires together on, you know, you cannot tie two wires without a gate in between, but uh, you can split a wire and feed it into two gates. And you evaluate the circuit bottom up. So, you know, once you set all the inputs, you can, so these are the input wires, then you can, you know, there's a topological sorted order in which you can evaluate everything until you get to the output, okay? So, this is all simple, basic uh, uh, digital circuits, no memory gates, nothing here, okay? Just uh, uh, you feed inputs, you get output. So, you know, uh, if you have some small function like R, the truth table, I mean, it's just already a single gate. But even if you have something, you know, like x greater than y, so that's a truth table where x and y are, let's say, two-bit inputs, you can build a small circuit which, you know, corresponds to this, right? In fact, any function, any, say, a Boolean function like this, you can take the truth table and there's a mechanical way of writing out a circuit for that. Unfortunately, that circuit will be pretty large, okay? So that doesn't really get our 
uh, what we wanted. But the point is, it's not like we want to do any arbitrary function on you know, some two domains. We are interested in doing specific functions for which you already have some sort of a program, right? Like the auction. So you take that program and you can convert it. If the program is efficient, you can get write a small circuit. Um, and so you know, interesting problems already come as small programs or small circuits. Okay, so I just want to point out. So I'm not trying to do every function. I'm trying to do every function that has an efficient computation, efficient insecure computation. I want to compute, you know, you compute it using a secure multi-party computation, which is uh, similarly efficient. Okay, here is my protocol. Uh, you know, protocol from GMW, but not quite. They don't have it this way, but um, subsequent work used it that way. Um, and it uses oblivious transfer as a trusted third party. Okay, so that's how I'm going to describe it. And no other computational assumptions. And the idea is something very kind of important. It uses something called secret sharing. There are different flavors of secret sharing. This is a particularly simple form of secret sharing, but it's a very crucial concept. I'll try to explain as we go. Uh, so, the, okay, so here's what secret sharing basically is. Suppose there is some secret, okay, uh, some value, S, which I want to give to two parties, Alice and Bob, such that neither party knows what the secret is, but if they come together, they can reconstruct the secret. Okay? So here is a simple way of doing that. Um, so write the secret as sum of two field elements. Okay, so let me be more specific. Think of them as all bits. This thing works over arbitrary finite fields, but where you can do addition and multiplication. Actually, just groups would be fine, you know, where you can do addition. Uh, but you know, think of them as bits for concreteness. So addition in the binary field corresponds to XOR. Okay, the unit, uh, the identity of addition is zero. The Inverses for itself for a number, so it's a you know, um, and the multiplication is and. Okay. Okay. So, so when I say I take a secret, so it's a bit, and I share it. What I mean is it's a randomized procedure. I pick a and b randomly, uniformly randomly, conditioned on a x or b being equal to my secret bit. Okay. So basically, you could think of it as I pick. Um, uh, a uniformly at random and then set B to be S X or A for the binary field plus and minus are both X or okay. uh, but yeah, more generally if you are working with a larger field you want to say set B to be S minus A so that A plus B equal to S. So A and B each are uniformly random elements in the field but their sum they are correlated so that their sum is equal to this particular element S. And whenever I do this procedure, I'm going to write, so this is my secret. I shared it into two shares. So I'll say S1 and S2 inside these boxes means, you know, they are the two shares generated according to this procedure. So it's a random variable, right? I get them used from this random process. Um, okay, so I'm going to now, you know, show how to use this on, um, uh, to compute a function that's given to us as a circuit. The circuit has gates which, you know, for the Boolean circuits, I'm going to use XOR and AND gates. Okay? That's all I need. Uh, it's a complete uh, family. Um, or more generally for fields, the two gates I'm going to use are plus and product. Okay? Um, and of course, constants and so forth. Okay? I want to evaluate any function that's represented using a circuit using those gates. So here's the plan. I have five minutes to tell you that. Uh, so consider any wire in the gate. Okay? If I actually evaluate this gate circuit, uh, consider wire in the circuit. If I actually evaluate the circuit, this wire will have some value. Think of that as a secret. We may or may not know what that value is. Okay? What we are going to maintain is that this value should not be known to anyone. So we are going to maintain a secret sharing of that value between the two parties between Alice and Bob, okay? So they each will have a random, say, bit, which XORs to this bit. Since they don't know the other party's bit, they won't know anything about this bit other than what they could, you know, figure out without knowing the other party's input, okay? So that's a plan. 
throughout we are going to you know, we are going to evaluate this circuit uh, like in the topological sorted manner I described wire by wire or gate by gate. Um, so each output gate you know uh, for each gate its output wire I need to compute the value for. So I'll do it in that order and at any point for any wire I'll have the wires value secret shared. Okay, so so you know so there's another wire V I'll that secret shared. Once I have both U and V, I'm ready to evaluate this. So I need some procedure so that from these shares of U and V, the parties can end up with shares of W. Okay, so W will be uh, the value U, you know, the gate applied to U and V. Okay, that's what I want to do. First of all, for addition gate, okay, when the gate is addition, this is very trivial. Uh, or very simple at least. So you want W to be equal to U plus V. We already have U1 plus U2 equal to U, V1 plus V2 equal to V. We are going to just define W1 as U1 plus V1, W2 as U2 plus V2. So those are two random bits XOR together, these are two random bits XOR together. But if you XOR W1 and W2, you will get W. Right? Just you will be doing U1 plus U2 plus V1 plus V2, which is u1 plus, uh, yeah, so which is u plus v, right? right? You'll be doing u1 plus v1 plus u2 plus v2, which is equal to u1 plus u2 plus v1 plus v2. Okay, so for the addition gate, and it's, why is this a secure thing to do? They didn't even talk to each other. So that by doing this in a one step, you didn't learn anything more than you had before that one step. Okay, so that is nice. The problem is, um, what about multiplication? Okay, for multiplication, if I were to write it, so I want W1 plus W2 equal to W. Um, so what is W? W is U times V. U is U1 plus U2, V is V1 plus V2, okay? Now, unfortunately, if you open the brackets, you'll see that, you know, I cannot, there is no value that this guy can compute as W1 and this guy can compute as W2, just using the local values uh, such that, in W1 plus W2 looks like that. In particular, there are terms like U1, V2, and V1, U2 there, right? U1, V2, and V1, U2, and they cannot compute that. Right? Just without communicating, they cannot compute that. So here is where they are going to use OT. So here is, okay, let's start, you know, get started. So they want to compute this secret sharing. One thing we can do is, okay, we know each bit by itself has to be random. That's the definition of secret sharing. So we'll use a fresh bit, okay, fresh random bit. W1. So Alice just picks her shares. She doesn't need to know Bob's share at this point. But now somehow we have to make sure Bob picks W2 consistently. And for that they will just use OT. So what do I mean by that? We already you know, you know this is a small function. Uh, you know, so it's a small function in which W2, if you expand that and you know, write W2 equal to something minus W1. From Alice's point of view, the only unknowns there are u2 and v2. Okay, that's Bob's input, so two-bit input. So there are only four possible values Bob can have. We can do our naive protocol. You know, we make a list of four things, Bob comes and picks up one of them. Okay? So that's a very conceptually simple protocol. You can do better than that, but you know, it's one out of, using one out of four OT, you can do uh, uh, this multiplication. So at the end of that, they end up with w1, w2, which will be a secret share, a fresh secret share of W. Okay, any questions on that? Was it too quick? So this is kind of the heart of that protocol. Okay. Um, so I said, you know, there's a two-party thing, but actually you can do it with arbitrary number of parties, so M parties. Always we'll maintain an M-way secret sharing instead of a two-way secret sharing, which just means that the, you know, uh, S will be a sum of random M bits, uniformly random condition on their sum being S. Um, and addition is as before, multiplication is, you know, I've given a slightly different description here, which actually is a little more efficient than the other one. Um, so again, you expand this, uh, uh, you know, it, all the terms, you get terms of the form UI, VI, that's good, a party I can compute UI, VI itself. But you also have terms of the form UI, VJ and VI, UJ, you know, same thing. Um, 
So what we'll do is uh, UIVI part AI computes to compute uh, UIVJ. So what we'll do is, yeah, UIVJ, we'll compute a sharing of UIVJ such that the ith party has one share, the party i has one share and party j has the other share, okay? Um, how do they do that? Well, this, we will use an naive algorithm. It's a two-party protocol now between party i and j. So party i picks a i j and let the other j party come and pick up this. This actually needs only, uh, you know, uh, one one out of two OT to compute uh, ui vj. And then there's another term vj ui, which again they use another OT to do. And so once you have all pairs UI VJs, you know, everybody locally can define their shared WI in this way. Okay? So it works. That's all I wanted to say about this very simple protocol. So you know, we have been a little quick about that protocol, but it's a, it shows you some of the key elements, right? The secret sharing and why OT is useful. MPC, um, I'm just going to conclude with a couple of slides. So, you know, we are not going to be able to cover everything about MPC in this tutorial because it's a whole big world out there. Like, uh, there are several dimensions in which, you know, this problem can be varied. The kind of, we talked about some passive actor. There are other things like covert, uh, static adaptive, and the, how many parties you can corrupt. Uh, what kind of uh, simulation, is it efficient, inefficient? Um, there will be, you know, the timing model, there are a lot of complexity parameters, including so efficiency parameters like amount of communication, how it grows with the size of input, um, so forth. But also other complexity parameters like what kind of computational complexity, what kind of computational hardness are you assuming uh, to create your protocol, right? Uh, so those are also parameters. So there's a, and this picture is by no means complete. People keep coming up with you know, variations which do make sense in you know, special cases. So we are certainly not going to cover all of it. We'll cover a few things. So what we are going to do just to, so today afternoon, Muthu and uh, Arpita, she is on her way I and mean, she's already in, on campus. Um, so Muthu will talk about zero knowledge proofs. Um, came a little bit before this GMW paper I was talking about. Uh, it's just a special case of multi-party computation, and there's a lot of concepts which are key to, you know, things like simulation came out of defining zero knowledge proofs. Um, so it's a key ingredient in going from passive to active security, you know, uh, in, in, in the, conceptually. And Arpita will talk about a particular protocol called garbled circuit, Yao's garbled circuit. This was the very first protocol that could do general two-party computation. Um, it is only passive secure. Now, of course, there are variants of that which are secure against active adversaries. Um, but it's very simple, very efficient, and still many of the implementations I showed you in the beginning are based on garbage circuits. Okay, so it's a very key, key primitive. It has used beyond MPC. You can use it because it's efficient. You can use it in some sort of a fancy, as some sort of a fancy encryption in some sense on which you can compute. So it gets, um, gets some, I know, more use, has some more uses. Tomorrow, you all, um, Arpita, Muthu, and I will talk. And you all will talk about something called randomized encoding. It's a really interesting and uh, by now important concept in secure multi-party computation, uh, something that you, know, you all and his co-authors have been uh, instrumental in developing. Um, it has applications beyond MPC, but uh, it has a lot of applications in MPC. Uh, Yao's garbage circuit could be thought of as a special case of randomized encoding. Uh, so you all will talk about all that. Arpita will come back and talk about oblivious transfer. So I already told you what oblivious transfer is. One key component in ob oblivious transfer is something called OT extension. As used in practice, it makes it, things much more efficient than otherwise. So she will describe all that. Uh, Mutu will talk about composition. I mentioned universal composition, but there are other various intermediate notions of composition. And um, basically, it's always a question of if you run two or more instances of the protocol, same protocol, different protocols, will it still be secure? If, you know, how do you define security so it'll remain secure when multiple instances run? And I'll talk about something a little um, uh, different 
from uh, you know kind of practical application. It's a more theory question. You step back and ask some fundamental questions of you know which functionalities are easier and which are harder in in some cryptographic sense, right? So it's a study of functionality. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the final day, Vasilis will, uh, he's not here yet, assuming his flight will be on time and so forth. Um, well, he's supposed to arrive on Tuesday, so he should be, should be there. He'll talk about honest majority MPC, uh, which is you know, a very important uh, part of MPC literature, uh, because then we can give very strong security guarantees. And also, it turns out it's useful as uh, more, not just as an MPC protocol, but as a representation of computation, some sort of a robust circuit, if you will. Okay? And you all will start from there, you know, of using this idea of MPC as being some sort of a robust uh, encoding of computation. Uh, so you'll talk about a cool idea called MPC in the head, which is like, uh, yeah, you'll see what it is. Uh, it's a very versatile technique for creating <laughs> MPC protocols. A lot of the you know, theoretically uh, best protocols out there are now, you know, have MPC in the head in there. And finally, Vasilis will talk about asynchronous MPC. So everything we talked about uh, till then would be in a, in a slightly idealized model of computation, of networks called a synchronous network. Uh, things get kind of uglier when you have a asynchronous, uh, kind of more realistic model of uh, network. Um, and if you want to keep your efficiencies without implementing a synchronous network on top of that, you need to do things differently. So Vasilis will talk about that. Okay, so that's all I have. I'll make a couple of, uh, any questions before I close the talk? Okay. Okay, so yeah, thank you. That's all the talkers.